You know those moments when you just can't breathe? Can we take a moment now and breathe together? In and out. In and out and in and out. I so wanted to start this sermon off with something pithier, something more intellectual, more cerebral and smart, and then I started writing it, and I realized that all I wanted to do with you this morning is breathe. Whether it was nerves or fear or anger, grief or shock or just soaring pollen count. This past week has been filled with moments when I just couldn't catch my breath. When an empty feeling took over my chest and a shallow, unproductive cough bubbled up inside me only to disappear in a quiet, solemn puff of air. Now, most of you know that I have very weak lungs. But I'm okay, no medical report here. But as far as this shortness of breath, I don't think I'm alone here. We can't breathe. Those words that Eric Garner cried out as his life was choked out of him in 2014 have continued to echo and deepen as our country, our world struggles through gasps and gulps, through heaves and wheezes. And it seems cliche to say that the suffocating news stream feels relentless, but this past week really pushed that cliche to outsized proportions. We began the week with over 60 deaths and over 2,000 injuries among Palestinian protesters in Gaza. And on the same day, our beloved community lost a beloved member, Ginny Fox. And before we could even catch our breath, a school shooting in Texas claimed the lives of 10 students, leaving 10 others mortally wounded and many others just wounded. All targeted by a 17-year-old fellow student, the 16th school shooting in our country so far this year that has resulted in injury or death. And those are just the big events, which were accompanied by all kinds of less reported, breathtaking events in between. We can't breathe without the whiff of some new tragedy filling our nostrils, our mouths, our lungs with the stench of sadness. So we come to this Sunday, the threshold between this past week and the week to come. We come to this church, the threshold between the way the world is and the way we wish the world to be. And we come to this service, the threshold between the suffocation that engulfs us outside and the hope of new inspiration inside our weary hearts. And I kept trying to find the smart way to start this sermon. And then I realized that all I want to do with you today is breathe. I've been grieving the loss of my professor, the professor to so many of us, Reverend Dr. James H. Cohn. And as I stumbled through this week, I thought back to the first time that Dr. Cohn ever yelled at me in public. And yes, I say the first time because there were many more times. In this instance, our class was discussing a very cerebral article about race relations written by a white academic, and Cohn was dismissing it as bloodless, spiritless, and I raised my presumptuous little hand and tried to make a case for why calmly, sterile, dryly reasoned thought 
exercises had their place. And Cohn stopped me. And he said, do you want to be in this class? Because here, we do not think race relations are an intellectual exercise. Here, we open ourselves up to passion and spirit. If you want to stay in this class, you'd better get out of your head and breathe into the spirit. And I kept trying to find a smart way to start this sermon. And then I realized that all I want to do with you today is breathe. And that's why I am so damn grateful that today is Pentecost Sunday. Not because this Pentecost Sunday service is going to bring back lives or solve the world's problems or finally convince this country that we have a gun problem that is killing our children. I'm grateful that today is Pentecost Sunday because the original Pentecost event was today, 50 days after that original Easter event, when our battered, broken, early Jesus-following ancestors hid together in a room that was just a little bit smaller than this one. Terrified of the continuing threats to their well-being outside, and while they sat in that room, they were electrified into breathing a new kind of breath, a divine spirit that moved them to imagine what they had always thought unimaginable, to interrupt their mournful complacency and attempt to speak languages that they had never thought they could even begin to understand. Now, we hear a lot of talk about theology, which is just a fancy word for the study of God. And we hear a lot about Christology, which is just word for the study of Jesus, and I'm a fan of both things, went to school for it and everything, really in debt because of it. But in times like these, when you start the week with dozens of deaths in the news and a huge death in your congregation, and then finish the week with 10 more avoidable deaths crying out for attention, Sometimes theology and Christology can feel as useless as thoughts and prayers. And that's why I'm so grateful that today is Pentecost Sunday. Because yes, you can talk theologically and Christologically about Pentecost and about tragedy, but Pentecost is about something different. And the fancy word they've come up with for that is pneumatology. And the root of that term, pneuma, is an ancient Greek word for breath, for spirit, for soul. And in our tradition, theology and Christology can't do jack for you without pneumatology. Pentecost is the day we remember that there was a moment when the Holy Spirit, a divine breath, came rushing into the midst of a broken community and empowered our spiritual ancestors when they were at their lowest, when they were fresh from mourning the political assassination of their leader and were flailing around, looking for ways to simply hold their scrappy little community together. And in the midst of their suffocating grief, our scripture tells us that those ancestors were filled with a wind that did something not just to them, but through them. And today, just like those scrappy spiritual ancestors way back then, we are aching for inspiration. And the root of the word inspiration means breath, to breathe. So I can't think of a better way to start the search for new inspiration than to come be here with all of you in beloved, messy community and to simply suggest that we breathe together and welcome inspiration as it comes because we know that it has the power to electrify. Our tradition assures us 
that that inspiration we now seek came to our spiritual ancestors way back at that first Pentecost. Why wouldn't it come to us today <laughs> on this Pentecost Sunday? The trick to all of it is paying close attention to what you are breathing into your soul and what you are breathing back out into the world. So what did you breathe in this week that resuscitated your hope? What did you breathe in this week that resurrected your spirit? I breathed in thousands of our fellow faithful standing firm as they were arrested for speaking the language of justice for the Poor People's Campaign. I saw them finding ways that the languages of oppression, of broken systems intersect, and I saw their embodiment of spirit giving rebirth to a dream begun 50 years ago by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I breathed in an African-American Episcopal bishop, the most reverend Michael Curry, turning the royal wedding on its head, using the fiery words of Dr. King and of Teilhard de Chardin to transform a classically glamorous spectacle into a rallying cry for a history-infused love revolution. I breathed in our beloved Ginny Fox, lovingly accompanied to her death by the amazing family she built with her beloved husband, Lenny. I breathed in Ginny's children and her children's children loving her into death in the same way she has loved them all of their lives. These are the things we must breathe in, even as the suffocating stench of the same old empire status quo surrounds us. We must seek the divine spirit that is aching to break into our destructiveness and teach us new languages, new breathing techniques, new love. And until we can understand what real love is, until we can understand what real circular communal breath is, until we can fully understand the language of all who cry out for justice, we must be a Pentecostal people, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. We must get out of our heads. And we must get into our bodies. We must hush our own language and listen for the language of something that is beyond our imagination. Reverend Dr. James Cohn, channel into this place and tell us again to get out of our heads and to breathe into the spirit. Would you rather have all the answers? Or would you rather have the humility to open yourself up to connections you never knew were possible? When this world's tragedy convinces us that we can't breathe, what if we tried to breathe into the Spirit? What if it didn't feel like a compromise? What if it felt like an invitation to a new kind of breath? And what if when we kind of got off that path and thought, what are we even doing? We turned to the person next to us and said, do you still know what we're doing? Just to see if they could remind you. That's what community is. That's what beloved, messy community is. That's what spirit-infused, beloved, messy community is. That's what we're here for. What if we were the old and the young who are being gifted the power to see new visions and dream new dreams. Could you breathe into that spirit? Now, you've already heard represented up here in those amazing sounds. 
that Toby and Robert brought to us. You've heard me stumble around, get all excited and hop around and talk about Pentecost. But now I want to invite up somebody who always teaches me how to get out of my head, get into my body. So Mary Ellis, please come up here and finish this sermon. Seven, Hamer. Eight, Calcaneus. Nine, Pubis. Ten, Skull. Eleven, Fingers. Twelve, Sternum. Thirteen, Sacrum. Fourteen, Neck. <coughs> Fifteen, Patellas, 16, calves, 17, scapula, 18, orbital cavities, 19, stomach, 20, lungs, 21. One, nose, two toes, three elbows, four, shoulders, five, Seven femur, eight calcaneus, nine pubis, ten skull, eleven fingers, twelve sternum, thirteen sacrum, fourteen. Patellas. Sixteen. Cats. Seventeen cats. 